here as a Chief Technology Officer for Oncology, Informatics, and Genomics. So um, I, I'm really glad to have today this panel because in a way, uh, we are looking at the present, but we are also looking at the future of biotechnology and biomedicine. So uh, let me first introduce the topic uh, of data science in biotechnology, because this is a multidisciplinary approach to making foundational contributions using applied artificial intelligence and machine learning to discover new drug targets, determine biomarkers of response, to predict uh, population health trends, and to make fundamental shifts from sick care to health and well-being. This is really our vision for humanity, as the Prime Minister Anna Bernabich said this morning. This is part of the vision also for Serbia's Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution. And here, uh, the government plans to use the advances and leverage the blurring lines between the new digital biology, AI, robotics, and other advanced technologies. In essence, to reinvent medicine. So when we talk about uh, data science in biotechnology, what are the applications, you may ask? So first of all, understanding the next puzzles of the basic human biology, as well as the mechanisms of disease. There is very attractive proposition to change um, how we find new drug targets, how we actually find new treatments, new vaccines. Understanding how drugs are already approved by the regulators and how these already approved drugs can be used for new diseases. To understand how to make most of these drugs. Other applications is being smarter about how we run clinical trials because there are there is tremendous time and resources spent on these. How do we acquire real-world evidence in order to use this in basic research and discovery? Combine that with new, um, the new, what we call the digital biology, which is the new genomic data, which is whole genome sequencing, epigenome, copy number variations, microbiome research, and how do we combine this into a biomedical and biomedicine uh, research proposition. Um, so for successful data science, there are actually four pillars. First is foundational data sets, large-scale population data, um, and then for each of these disease areas, there are different uh, ways to do data engineering as well as to apply data governance, which includes information security and data privacy from patient point of view, uh, as well as artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is how we leverage all of these uh, technologies and data. So now we see the transformational potential of the emerging data technologies and strategies uh, in order to galvanize an organization to believe and achieve their benefits. For this, what we need are multidisciplinary efforts, as well as um, um, both from technology, uh, from science point of view, and this expertise in analytics, data science, imaging, AI, and deep understanding of the broader digital landscape of current and emerging technologies is needed. So this is why in this panel today we bring multiple perspectives from academia, from government and industry to discuss what it takes 
to bring new breakthroughs in and create impact in healthcare and society. So um, we will discuss all aspects from government policies in advanced technologies in data and AI. So um, let me introduce my esteemed uh, panelists. Um, and I'm very glad to have Dr. Mikhailo Jovanovic, uh, who's uh, the director of the Office for the IT and e-government of Serbia. Dr. Mikhailo Jovanovic um, had a master's in electrical engineering and a PhD in economics. And he also hold a, holds a title of assistant professor for the scientific and quantitative methods. He has uh, an illustrious uh, career for the past 20 plus years. Um, he is a member, was a member and coordinator of the executive board of the Post of Serbia. Um, as well as he has had many awards in his career. Uh, and as of April 2017, he worked as an e-government advisor of the cabinet of the prime minister. Um, in his spare time, he writes many books. He's an author of several book, books, monographs, 30 expert scientific papers in the field of information and communication technologies, e-business and economics. And um, um, I'm very glad to have his perspective in the field of e-government, the establishment of first quantified certification bodies for issuing qualified electronic certificates and timestamps in the Republic of Serbia. Um, so, uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Dr. Jovanovic. Thank you for join, joining us. Um, and then we have Dr. Milan Petkovic, who is the head of AI and data science at Philips. Um, he finished his a PhD in Netherlands in computer science and AI um, some years ago, and is now the head of connected care uh, AI and data science at Philips, and he's also uh, part-time, a full professor at Technical University of um, Eindhoven. Um, professor Petkovic is also a member of the board of directors of the um, Advanced AI, Data and Robotics uh, at the European Commission. He has authored more than 25 patents and 100 journal and conference uh, publications as well as um, he has several books, including a recent one on data science and healthcare. And I'm also very pleased to welcome Dr. Ali Tata Taha Koch. I practiced this, believe me, <laughs> <laughs> beforehand. <laughs> uh, so, um, he actually finished his doctoral studies um, in the United States at the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, with full scholarships, um, he joined Intel and, uh, he, uh, in 2006 as, a, as an R&D engineer. And during his tenure at Intel, he had an amazing um, in inventor career, he had developed 61 patents, published um, many scientific articles, developed and, man and mentored uh, international projects, and uh, was awarded as one of the top 10 most uh, uh, patent inventors at Intel. Uh, then he returned to uh, Turkey in 2014, and he started the work as the chief counselor of the prime ministry, uh, and in the same year was appointed as the head of information technologies of the presidency. Um, by the discretion of his uh, high excellency, President Recep Tayyip, uh, Erdogan, uh, Dr. Koch was appointed as the head of Digital Transformation Office uh, in 2018. 
Um, in addition to his uh, duties at the presidency, he is a member of Turksat, uh, Satellite Communications, Cable TV, Business Inc., and also teaches graduate and PhD uh, courses at the Department of Electrical Engineering at Bilkent University. Um, and what's interesting is he's also a licensed pilot. Um, that's, um, you know, uh, quite a few things to do in your free time, right? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, and um, we were uh, very honored to be joined today by Dr. Branka Rakic, uh, who's actually leading a new AI Institute uh, of Serbia. And this is located in Novi Sad, the beautiful city of Novi Sad, where we're all going tonight. Um, so uh, welcome, Dr. Rakic. Um, she actually finished her PhD at Vienna University in molecular biology. So, so she traveled into this AI in medicine exactly from the opposite yeah. end where I started. So um, that I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're here. And uh, she was also a consultant of the top 10 pharma companies. She was a partner and lead scientist at the Biologics Hub uh, before this new post, um, as well as a scientist at Cambridge Cell Networks, uh, where she uh, led different biomarker initiatives. Um, and I'm really honored to have you here, uh, Dr. Rakic. Thank you. So after this introduction, I'd love to uh, pose a few questions to my panelists. Um, and first, I would like to start uh, with um, the question of where uh, and what are the most important uh, technology trends in data science and engineering in order to create impact in biotech and medicine, and how to improve clinical outcomes and increase wellness and quality of life. Um, so I would like to start with Dr. Petkovic, if you would please uh, sure. address the question. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, yeah, this question I think we can address from two perspectives. Uh, one would be um, uh, industrial perspective and look at the trends that uh, we can actually very quickly bring to, to real life. And, and you can look also from the perspective of uh, research perspective, where you would say, hey, what are the important uh, technologies that, uh, that we should be working on so that we can in a longer term bring them to life? And I'll, I'll start with, uh, with the more industrial uh, view, because um, if you are, I mean, uh, if you look at AI, AI was invent invented like in 50s last uh, decade, last, last century. So, uh, and uh, it was a big promise and then only, only in in last two decades, or maybe even the last decade, it came to really a uh, situation that that we can really apply it uh, in industry and uh, uh, have uh, wider adoption of uh, the AI technology. Um, so, so that, that that's why I don't I, I don't think we should repeat this mistake uh, once more, and uh, that's why I think we should really go step by step. And obviously, first that comes is data. What we've seen in the last decade is that data became the center point uh, in each company, in each sector, including this, uh, this sector. Um, and that comes with all kinds of technologies around data. Starting from data analytics, you might say, okay, this is basic, but many companies are still actually not, not uh, delivering on that. And then we, we invented data science, uh, and I'm also a professor at uh, faculty that actually has bachelor and master in data science, so that becomes like in the past, computer science very very important, um, and 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 going going further and further, you can start thinking of like uh, more, um, you know, how can we bring more value with data? And and uh, in Philips, we always uh, uh, refer to this like creating insights from data, and not only any insights, but actionable insights, insights that actually can bring value because someone can act on these insights and then create value by acting on these insights. And I can give you an example. So you have like a patient in ICU, and you, you collect all the measurements from the patient, obviously, uh, heart rate, uh, blood pressure, et cetera. 
And based on these measurements, you can create alarms. That's the situation that we have now. So if the heart, heart rate goes up uh, uh, or blood pressure goes down or, or different type of combinations, you can say, okay, patient is not doing well. Is that enough for, for, uh, for a nurse or, or a clinician in ICU? It's not, because he would like to understand what he needs to do to get his patient stable. Is it tachycardia, or is it tachycardia with uh, hemoinstability, or is it something else? So you would like to provide him an insight that he can act on so that he can actually help the patient. A very important technology, insight genera generation of insights uh, nowadays. So if you go further towards, towards more the technologies that, that are upcoming, uh, I would, would love to mention um, Digital Twin, and not only digital twin, twin for, for uh, you know, April engines, but also digital twin of a patient. So can we actually get to the level that we can really understand, you know, how we function, and instead of only having our car bringing for regularly for, uh, for the, the check once a year, can we actually get to a situation that we understand what's going on with us so that we can proactively actually go on checks and then ensure that we can basically uh, live good life. Um, if you look at deep learning, I think this is also technology that change uh, basically very much um, AI field and uh, technology that uh, that brought actually uh, us to this wider adoption of uh, of AI in industry uh, with many different applications. And this technology is further developing. So I would uh, I would expect uh, uh, much more to come in this area, uh, including um, generative uh, adversarial networks. Uh, and uh, uh, creation of synthetic data and, uh, and uh, several other fields in, uh, in, this, uh, in this domain. Um, so I would say uh, the, these for me would be the, the most important technologies uh, to look at and, and further develop and then, and then develop them in a way that we can actually bring them to practice uh, in a meaningful way. Thank you. That's very, very insightful, um, uh, especially about the digital twin. So, but we'll hold that topic and we'll ask something more later. So, um, Dr. Koch, would you also like to address the question? Sure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dimitro <laughs> and dear partners. First of all, I want to uh, thank uh, the government of Republic of Serbia and as well as the World Economic Forum and the UNDP for organizing this great event. I'm so happy to be here. And also, I congratulate my Serbian colleagues about officially launching their Center of uh, Excellence or Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So it is, uh, I'm happy to uh, witness this expansion of this global network. We are also a part of, Turkey is a part of this network as well. So expansion of this great network is also always beneficial for all the participants. So co coming to your point is, you know, the, if you look at the biotech, so the core technology that always we are talking about is chemistry, bi bio biology, and medicine. But right now with the data, data analytics, and also the especially computing power. I worked long years at Intel, so I know how the computing power changed so drastically from the making the all the nodes smaller and smaller. So we can we definitely maybe the en enhancement about the, this artificial intelligence because of the mostly the talent and the, the capacity of the computing power. We combine all of them and we call it data science. So currently, most probably, the biotech industry is going to be sitting on the uh, data science instead of chemistry, biology, and uh, medicine. So with artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data mining, uh, we are just going to combine in this, all this technology in the healthcare. But in order to do it and make it successful to do it, we need to make, have a lean management. So lean management in healthcare is an important topic. So because all these changes is going to be a drastic change. So you need to convince people about this change as well. So when you talk about the digital healthcare, there are like five steps we can talk about. First of all, we start with education, then prevention, then diagnostics, then treatment, then post-treatment. All of these five steps, we can include the new data sciences, artificial intelligence as well, maybe computer vision as well. For example, for the education part, it's very hard to train doctors. So if you can come up with a simulation environment that you can uh, repeat surgeries over and over and again, the doctors are going to get better and better. And also you can get the feedback from the simulation saying that this doctor's quality is higher, getting worse, or the stress level is, you can measure the stress level of the doctors as well during the simulations. So as a pilot, I love simulations because instead of flying long flights, I always do simulator jobs. And it is also uh, suits well in the, my logbook. So maybe doctors are not going to have the actual surgeries in the future, but simulated surgeries. So it's going to be a very useful 
helpful for the doctors as well. Then prevention is also, uh, after the edu uh, education, prevention is another thing. Nowadays, everybody is using the IOTs, like uh, variables. So we are collecting all the data right now from the heart rate to how many steps that we ha have, all the, even the, what we eat. So that's the reason that we, need, we can use some data analytics to prevent some e diseases. And the third thing is after uh, is the diagnostic. So especially for the cancer treatments, we know that uh, if you make it earlier, it's better. So that's the reason that we, we need to use computer vision and the data analytics to uh, uh, capture or the understand the diagnose the cancer treatments and then start the treatment as soon as possible. And treatment. So right now everybody is talking about precision medicine or personalized medicine, with the data analysis. Everybody is different. With their lifestyle is different. Their genomics is different. So at the end of the day, treatment is going to be done personalized. And with the, also the, with the AI, we, are, we have seen lots of studies going on with the drug discovery, because we can have, again, the simulation environment for uh, reacting the medications to different proteins, so we can come up with a shorter time for the drug discovery. And the last thing is the post-treatment. Uh, everybody wants to do this post-treatment tre at their homes. With the virtual networks and virtual uh, following up the uh, patients, you can do it much more faster because you can have the uh, physical therapy on their, at home and using some uh, image processing as well as the uh, computer vision so that everybody's going to get their treatment faster and cheaper. At the end of the day, all this technology is going to be lean and a little bit less costly because the cost is the biggest uh, power for the changing the system in the health industry. So hopefully I'll be using all the, in this all five steps if you can able to use these technologies, especially data analytics, I think we're going to be successful. Thank you, Dr. Koch. Um, you're still alive, so I must believe in the simulation method <laughs> <laughs> as a pilot. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Jovanovic, would you also like to address the question? Uh, dear Nevenka, thank you very much for your introduction. I'm uh, very happy that I'm participating in this Biotech Future Forum International Conference. As a host, I will use this opportunity to continue in, in Serbian language. Dakle, kada govorimo o podacima i njihovom značaju, ja bih to malo posmatrao iz ugla onoga što mi radimo zapravo kao vlada Republike Srbije i koje su naše ideje i perspektive. I tu bih počeo od rečenice koju je upotrebila naša predsjednica vlade kada je otvarala državni data centar u Kragovecu pre par godina i kada je rekla da je u 21. veku značajnije od novca su podaci. I upravo živimo u veku ili eri gde podaci dominiraju. Kada je u pitanju medicina i biotehnologija, ti podaci, verovatno je svuda to u svetu, ali i kod nas, dolaze iz dva izvora i naročito nas je borba protiv COVID-19 uverila u to. Jedno su zdravstveni podaci, podaci građana koji mogu doći iz zdravstvenog kartona i blago onim nacijama koje imaju taj zdravstveni karton građana na jednom mestu i podatke građana na jednom mestu o tome od čega su bolovali, koje su lekove primali i šta im se dešavalo u prošlosti. Drugi izvor podataka je svakako ono što smo uspeli da savladamo tokom COVID-a, a to je sekvencioneri i sekvencioniranje genoma, odnosno podaci koji se tiču ljudskog DNK i uparivanje ta dva strima podataka i korišćenje tih podataka, recimo na platformama za razvoj veštačke inteligencije, nešto što je praktično put za personalizovanu medicinu i pravi put za naučna istraživanja. I ono što vlada Republike Srbije želi da uradi je da na taj način pristupi analizi ovih podataka. Da ne uplašim javnost i građane, naravno da ćemo voditi računa kako to radimo i u narednom pitanju ću odgovoriti na to što sa polisi nivoa Želimo da uradimo da bi to mogli da radimo, jer naravno podaci građana i njihova privatnost su iznad svega. Hvala. 
I will continue in English because my Serbian is, is okay to understand, but uh, we'll, we'll switch back to English. Thank you. So, um, our next question is about um, addressing how does your own group, your own sphere of activities contribute in this field? And uh, what has been the biggest impact so far? And what is your vision for future impact? So here, actually, I would like to start with uh, Dr. Branka Rakic um, to address this question first. Um, thank you for the nice introduction. And I have the feeling that I have kind of um, another angle to the problems that you discussed, mm -hmm. but we can go back to that later. To answer your question, uh, so we are a new institute, Institute of Artificial Intelligence Serbia, uh, is formed uh, a year and a half, uh, and we have uh, 35 scientists, so we are not so big. I lead just a small group of a application of AI in healthcare and science, in life science. Um, since we are so new, uh, our uh, highest impact is quite modest for now, is that we managed to approach uh, approach our doctors uh, and research scientists, basic research scientists, that they're open and willing to work with us. So we have collaborations with already some medical institutions. Uh, we have collaboration with the pharmaceutical company. Uh, we can talk about the project later. So uh, we do feel that um, our role is big uh, in a sense that it should create an environment for developing a new AI researchers, you should kind of um, talk and communicate to public and show that AI is nothing uh, to be afraid of, but it's something can actually make a meaningful impact, especially in the healthcare sector. Um, and um, also to approach the doctors, find uh, uh, good collaborators and good research projects. So we wouldn't like to do research just for researching, but to make a meaningful impact. And if I might just add from the previous questions that you had, um, I'm um, more cautious, I guess, because of my previous education in molecular biology, more cautious of promising of what AI can do. Uh, biological systems are very complex, and if you would see any discovery in AI for pharma, let's say, uh, when um, an interview was given by um, a data scientist, a computational scientist, it's always a big, big promise. And then when a scientist in pharma company is saying about it, it's usually on the level of maybe it will, to a certain <laughs> extent, help in drug development. So there is a huge number of applications, but uh, I don't think that a single solution will just change the world. Thank you. I like that um, kind of leveled optimism yeah. <laughs> approach. <laughs> Thank you. So I would also like to ask um, uh, Dr. Petkovic to address the question. Sure. Thank you. So um, Philips, uh, uh, I'm, I'm coming from Philips, and uh, Philips is a company that maybe you know from by having a TV or some, some domestic appliances, but actually Philips nowadays is a healthcare company, focused healthcare company, and if you were unlucky to be in a hospital, then you probably have seen um, medical systems of Philips, uh, um, like MR scanners or ultrasound devices, patient monitors, uh, uh, x-ray machines, etc. cetera. Uh, our vision at Philips is to um, touch and improve uh, 2.5 billion lives by 2030, so a year, uh, every year. So uh, we, we measured this, uh, and um, uh, last year we touched uh, 1.7 billion people by our devices or systems, and, uh, and we believe that uh, that helped them actually to improve uh, or sometimes save their lives. Um, we have focused very much on something called quadruple aim, uh, which is basically to uh, improve patient outcomes. So with the technology that we bring uh, um, to a certain extent, uh, <laughs> bringing AI to this technology, uh, but always very careful because uh, uh, safety uh, is very important in, in healthcare. Yeah. Um, so we, we would like definitely to improve patient outcomes. Uh, and the second goal that we have is also to reduce costs because healthcare costs are 
um, very high. Uh, with the current trends, we see that uh, actually they will take, uh, uh, you know, in some years from now, a big por a portion of GDP for every country, which is not sustainable, uh, going to 50% by 2060 or something. Uh, if we continue with these trends, and then and then we are also focused very much on patient experience and uh, and uh, healthcare provider experience. So how can we actually improve that experience? Because uh, very often we see that um, just being in a hospital is not nice by uh, for patient, and uh, and we also seen especially during COVID crisis that uh, a lot of people left healthcare because of uh, high pressure uh, uh, put on them. So. Uh, we have a number of products which have AI and data, uh, and data science integrated, and we are very transparent about these products. So we list them, and, uh, and the healthcare providers and patients can, uh, can um, uh, check and see what, uh, what type of AI we have. And it goes from, it goes from, from uh, improving outcomes, uh, uh, like I was talking about insights, trying to create, help healthcare providers to from these data, extract these insights uh, and, and then basically act on these insights. So um, nowadays in, in hospitals, we see people, or in general, in general practices, we see people, healthcare providers that are really focused on the IT systems, trying to, to understand the data, to record actually everything because the, the healthcare system is digitized. So they need to record things. They need to write reports. They need to read. And, uh, and, and you would like to help them actually to make sense of this data in a faster way so that they can actually focus more on patient and not, not on, on, on IT systems. So that, that's an important, important part. And, and, uh, um, and there are a lot of processes in, in healthcare which are long and, uh, and uh, routine processes. I mean, starting from radiology. You have a radiologist sitting in the, in the, in the dark room looking at images. And then, and then basically you can try to help that person basically to make sense of these images in a faster way. It's a narrow task where AI can work very well. Or you go towards uh, uh, just operation in hospitals, which are um, not really industrialized as much as, uh, for example, you will see in the uh, manufacturing uh, uh, um, sector. So you would like, actually, to, uh, to help that operationally ensure that, that there is a bed for every patient and try to predict those type of things. So um, there, there are a lot of opportunities, definitely, uh, in this space. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Petkovic. Um, I especially like the message of not only finding insights and results, but these insights being actionable, mm. uh, especially from the point of view of the patient care, because all of this AI in, in healthcare should be prefaced by patient first. That's um, kind of on a daily basis um, that we need to get reminded. Uh, for uh, some of these big initiatives. Thank you. So I'd like to also ask uh, Dr. Jovanovic um, for uh, how, how do you, from your own uh, sphere of um, uh, your own organization, how do you uh, have impact in uh, data science in biotech and medicine? Da, hvala Nevenka na ovom pitanju koje je više nego aktualno. Iskoristit ću današnji skup da prezentujem kolegama i svima prisutnim o Srbije, a naravno i kolegama koji su došli iz inostranstva nove izmene i dopune zakona o ministarstvima koje upravo treba nova Skupština Republike Srbije da usvoji jedan kuriozitet kancelarija za IT je upravo koja je nastala pre pet godina i da smo se najviše bavili elektronskom upravom i razvojem različitih IT sistema, infrastrukture i svega onoga što je vezano za IT i se dalje transformiše i u ovom zakonu o ministarstvima dobijamo da između ostalog obavljamo poslove državne uprave koji se odnose na uspostavljanje i vođenje registra koji sadrži genetičke, biomedicinske i druge podatke od značaja za istraživanje i razvoj u oblasti biotehnologije, bioinformatike, bioekonomije, genetike i medicine. To znači da onog trenutka kada i Skupština bude usvojila ovaj zakon, odnosno izmene i dopune, 
mi ćemo imati osnov da predlažemo pod broj 1 zakon, odnosno zakonski okvir koji će omogućiti uspostavljanje ovog centralnog registra genetičkih, biomedicinskih i drugih podataka, a potom i krenuti da radimo na njegovom uspostavljanju, naravno uz donošenje odgovarajućih podzakonskih akata. I kao što iz ovoga vidjeti, cilj je da se ti podaci na određen način, koji će naravno biti propisani budućim zakonom, koriste pod broj 1 u kliničkim istraživanjima, dakle sve ono što su do sada različite kompanije imale problem da dođu do podataka i da te podatke koriste u istraživanjima na ovaj način će biti sistematski rešeno i naravno u primjeni personalizovane medicine, jer ćemo moći da koristimo te podatke i za lečenje građana. Tako da, evo na neki način ovo je ekskluzivna najava onoga što očekujem da će naredna vlada da radi, a pre svega Kancelarija za IT je upravo sa svima vama, da uspostavimo taj repozitorijom genetičkih i biomedicinskih podataka koji se dalje mogu koristiti u zdravstvene i istraživačke svrhe. Hvala. Hvala opet. So, you mentioned the large scale data repository of clinical data and we'll come back to that question later. Um, I would like to ask next uh, for two perspectives, one from government and one from industry perspective of uh, where do you see the biggest opportunities for new technological research and creating impact and insights from data and data science in biotech and healthcare. And I'd like to ask first Dr. Koch to address this question and uh, then Dr. Petković. Yeah, thank you very much again. Uh, so as the Digital Transformation Office uh, of the Republic of Turkey, we are solely responsible of the uh, AI and also big data in the government. So in last year, we just uh, announced our national artificial intelligence strategy, which is going to cover the, the, between 2021 and 2025. We have a huge ambitious target. Uh, we have around 84 million population and more than 200 universities in Turkey. And then we have a target at 2025 to have 50,000 AI or the data science experts. Yeah, 50,000 is a number is a little bit big, but uh, if in order to hit the target, you need to put first ambitious tar uh, targets. So hopefully we're going to achieve it till the 2025. But the biggest challenges and also biggest uh, outbreak is going to be talent. So we are looking for the talent uh, all around the world. So, uh, but the problem with the AI is, you know, we are not going to. Like, it's not like digitalization. Everybody is easy to use the cell phones or the uh, computers, but the AI knowledge is going to be lacking. So, but the people are trying to, we need to come up with uh, some kind of STEM in Turkey. Like we call it a trustworthy artificial intelligence STEM. So because every, all of us know that this, uh, AI systems are all black box. We don't know what is inside. So, and then we are not going to train all the human beings how to, uh, what the AI is doing, right? So it is. What if something is getting into the data and then there is an output. So what is inside this black box? No one knows. So we are thinking about in Turkey, whatever you sell as a product, you need to get a trustworthy uh, artificial intelligence stamp. And this, there's going to be a, like some checks and cross-border analysis. So then uh, we are focusing mostly on the AI ethics. So the biggest problem with this AI ethics is there needs to be a risk management framework. Otherwise, if you put ethics in the top, the innovation is going to get lower and lower. So you need to come up with a risk management framework. So then you need to analyze each system for a health uh, AI or the search, like a Google search AI. So are, if you have the same risk management algorithms, it's not going to be useful. So you need to, for each specific purposes, you need to come up with different uh, frameworks for to say truth that everything is, goes back to the talent and then the data. So we talk about data a lot, but uh, let me give you an example. So according to OECD numbers, so the per person MRI uh, results per person on average is double in Turkey. So we compare to OECD average. So we like to take MRIs in Turkey. I don't know why, but uh, it's maybe the latest and uh, fashion of the treatment. So we figured out that how we can use this data and then we come up with some like a brain MRI uh, data science and then an artificial intelligence project. With this project, what we figured out that instead of collecting, changing the, uh, replacing the doctors, we are going to help them. 
So if in the future, if we can convince the people that, because all of us know that with the artificial intelligence, it's sort of a doctor is healing you. If you, if you, anybody, if you say anybody, the only, any patient saying that, oh, this result is coming from artificial intelligence, there's going to be always a question mark. So everybody wants to have the personal treatment with a doctor. So then that's the reason that we are just having, instead of replacing the doctors, we are going to come and give it the uh, technologies to support the doctors. As I told you, that we, have, we, we don't have enough radiologists, so if you have this much of MRI, someone is to uh, take a report out of it. So then instead of changing the queuing algorithm from the first in, first out, we are just using the artificial intelligence to change this algorithm to urgent first, uh, urgent in, uh, uh, out. You know, so urgent, whoever is urgent, the doctor is going to see it first. But the urgency is going to be decided by the artificial intelligence. So because this MRI data using the, some neural networks algorithm, so it's going to be decided if there's a tumor or there's a, something wrong in the brain. So the doctor is going to see that MRI first instead of seeing thousands of MRI. And also, as you may know, the radiologists have some problems with after seeing multiple and hundreds of MRI data, they, they start to have blindness. So we need to be careful about the, using the talent especially using the doctors more effectively. So in the future, we are thinking about it. This is going to be a biggest issue. Maybe we can talk a little bit about the privacy as well. But if you think about the ethical perspective and then creating this risk framework, I think we're going to clean up this, uh, the privacy issues as well. Thank you. Uh, yes, we'll address the privacy issues as well and privacy-preserving technologies a little bit later. Um, so, uh, uh, but I like that tempered approach of uh, trying to uh, see which the AI algorithms, which problem are we solving before just carpet bombing <laughs> everything with AI. <laughs> so, thank you. So, Dr. Petkovic, what is your view for technology opportunities for, say, the next 10 years? Yeah, I yeah. very much agreed with uh, what was uh, just said. Uh, so I think these are the good directions, uh, definitely. Um, um, personalized uh, treatment, uh, I think it's becoming very important. And uh, because we were talking about data, maybe I just maybe put a bit of like um, emphasis on that part. Uh, um, it's nice, uh, it's important, uh, I think, to have uh, sort of different databases. And we were talking about uh, uh, having genomic database um, we already have a lot of data in hospitals, like electronic medical records. Uh, um, so we have to, um, in order to get to the personalized medicine, I think we also need to, to really understand also the context of the patient and, uh, uh, and not only focus on one narrow part uh, related to one um, disease, but also understanding uh, comorbidities of the patient and not only having uh, genomics and, 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 let's say, med medical records, but also uh, perhaps also like what happens in between because uh, the, the, the lifestyle of the patient, etc. cetera. Um, because as, as in Philips, we are really talking about continuum of health. So we are talking about starting from healthy living and we would like actually to keep people in healthy living. We would like to keep them all, all in that phase. Then you can think of prevention. So if, if people are based on genomics, for example, have certain uh, propositions, so how to, how to actually act on that, how to actually make uh, uh, sort of very early try to, to help them to avoid to get into disease. And then you get into, into all these uh, healthcare, uh, let's say, phases where you need to diagnose with MR and you need to help with AI, actually, as you said. Uh, you need to, to triage patients very quickly and then all these things. And then also you need to do proper treatment where, where also uh, all these data that comes together from genomics together with, with the medical records, together with uh, other insights uh, about the patient should come really together to, uh, to enable um, personalized treatment and in the best way help, uh, help patients and uh, keep them um, in, the healthy, uh, in the healthy phase of, of this continuum. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Petkovic. Um, and you mentioned something very important about collecting all of this data and uh, likely in a very uh, broad and longitudinal manner. So that leads me to my next question, which I will direct to Dr. Rakic, um, about large-scale data integration, uh, both opportunities as well as challenges. Um, I know to have an institute in AI and healthcare, you need these wide... Uh, 
genome-wide uh, population studies that include a lot of genomic data with a lot of sensitive information. Um, so there are recent examples like Map of Life by um, the uh, pharma company Novartis. Uh, there is an example of uh, Regeneron. Um, they have spearheaded the sequencing of two million people so far. Uh, together with um, Geisinger and UK Biobank, which is enormous um, feat. And recently, they published a paper in New England Journal of Medicine, um, really zeroing in on a protective gene, which protects you 50%, uh, has that power from, say, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Mm -hmm. So uh, such insights are tremendous. Uh, that insight came from half a million patients. Um, and um, it would be inspirational to hear from you what is your vision for your own institute and how do you plan these uh, international, like uh, multi-institutional collaborations in the future? Thank you, it's a great question. Uh, I mean, currently we are working more mostly on diagnostics, so AI and diagnostics like um, ECG analysis or finding patterns of uh, mm -hmm. disease patients in rare disease. Uh, for genomics, uh, we are just getting into it. I mean, it's a huge potential, of course. Uh, as you said, like for personalized medicine, uh, for understanding a mechanism of a disease, for finding a potential drug target for finding a biomarker, which is like a goal mm -hmm. in, 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 in biotech. Um, but there, there are uh, some problems. Of course, for this cohort, big studies, you need huge amount of patient data, which in Serbia we still don't have. Hopefully we will have in future. Uh, then um, it needs to be kind of standardized, both, both as a data and then also um, when you plan a study, so it's a biological system, it changes a lot, it depends on which time point uh, blood was drained, uh, what is the progress of the disease at that point, and all of these small things might change the data that much that even the met metadata that follows that would not make them explainable and usable. Uh, so. There are cohort studies in, like, for example, I just heard for cardiovascular diseases, like huge cohort studies of thousands of patients in separate countries, like, I don't know, Malta and some Europe, other European countries. But it's questionable whether they can be integrated together. It's questionable because they didn't plan the project together. They planned the project separately. Um, then the next question is uh, whether they can share this data. Uh, for now, I mean, uh, we seek for collaboration and we have uh, talked to several of, of networks. So they, at the moment, they function as a network and if you're part of the network, you can have an access uh, completely anonymized data. Uh, these, are, these kind of data already exist for some of the rare diseases, which we are very interested in, um, also for genomic studies in, in, in different diseases. But yeah, we need to, be um, really, again, I'm obviously very cautious um, on what is the data, data quality, what is the time points, how to integrate that, and then the legal issue, whether we can use that in the end. Uh, did I answer your question? Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, I like your answer, and that leads me to the next question, which is really about um, um, data privacy I for, for patient data and how to uphold, say, GDPR policies and other guidelines and how to practice um, great uh, data governance because when it's a clinical study, uh, then there are already regulations. However, there is new real-world data that is being generated all the time and that is really useful data um, I believe uh, healthcare is over $60 trillion in the world uh, business, and all of that data is not captured, is not put back into the system in order to be fully leveraged and utilized. So now my next question would be uh, for Dr. Jovanovic. 
um, to tell us uh, what is the perspective from the government of Serbia. We heard great plans uh, from uh, Her Excellency Brnabic um, about introducing AI even in uh, primary school. So with that comes uh, government policy for data privacy. So would you please address uh, how, how do you see and, and what is it that you do from uh, your sphere? Ovdje postoji nekoliko aspekata. Jedan je naravno tehnički aspekt čuvanja podataka na najbezbedniji način. Vlada Republike Srbije je u prethodnom periodu uspostavila dva državna data centra. Jedan je izgradila i on se nalazi u Kragujevcu koji je izgrađen pod najvišim tehničkim i bezbednostnim standardima koji upravo u fazi sertifikacije i očekujemo da će biti sertifikovan za tir 4, dakle najviši nivo pouzdanosti podataka gde omogućavamo smeštaj državnih podataka, lokalnih samouprava, ali imamo mogućnost da ponudimo to i komercijalnim korisnicima. I upravo recimo smo pre par meseci potpisali ugrovor sa jednom od najvećih svetskih IT kompanija, to je Oracle, koji će svoj public cloud upravo da uspostavi u Kragujevcu i to će biti prvi Oracle Public Cloud i Data Center uspostavljen izvan Evropske unije, što samo govori o kvalitetu i bezbednosti našeg Data Centera. S druge strane, naravno, dolazimo do toga gde se nalazi podaci i na koji način se oni čuvaju i pričali smo o tome. S jedne strane imamo najsavremeniju infrastrukturu za razvoj veštačke inteligencije, NVIDIN Supercomputer, gde sa naučnom zajednicom, sa start-upima, sa institutima, pravimo jedan ekosistem naučnika koji znaju da rade sa veštačkom inteligencijom i da razvijaju te projekte u toj crnoj kuti koja je možda samo malo lampice svetle, ali zapravo naša misija je da ove godine pravimo što veći ekosistem naučnika koji mogu da rade na toj platformi i uključili smo sve tehničke fakultete, skoro smo potpisali sporazum i s biološkim fakultetom, tu su naši vodeći instituti, ali i start-upovi koji se nalaze u naučno-tehnološkim parkovima, svi oni imaju u ovom trenutku pristup platformi za razvoj veštačke inteligencije i verujem da će taj kvantitet naredne godine početi da rađa kvalitet. S druge strane, tu su sirovi podaci. Vjerovatno je malo poznato da imamo fantastičnu saradnju s Ministarstvom zdravlja koje svoje najveće baze podataka upravo čuva u državnom data centru. Recimo, svi radiološki podaci ili podaci koji se nalaze u elektronskom receptu, a to su na stotine miliona recepata, da ne kažem koliko je to podataka, nalaze se u državnom data centru. Naravno, postavlja se pitanje zaštite tih podataka i objasnio sam kako ih tehnički štitimo i čuvamo, ali naravno i upotrebe podataka. Upotrebe podataka za istraživanja. I tu će sigurno morati mnogo da se radi na nivou zakona. Spomenuo sam ovaj budući zakon o uspostavljanju registra koji se drži genetičke i biomedicinske podatke, ali mislim da će i novo ministarstvo koje će se baviti naukom, tehnološkim razvojem i inovacijama sigurno imati priliku da razmišlja o polisiju kada je u pitanju razvoj veštačke inteligencije. Naime, mi smo kao vlada prvi među prvim zemljama u svetu koje još 2019. godine je donelo strategiju razvoja veštačke inteligencije, ali postavlja se pitanje da li treba da imamo i zakon i podzakonska akta koja će definisati tu oblast i primenu veštačke inteligencije, samim tim i način obrade i čuvanja podataka. Hvala. To je taj način čuvanja podataka. So, the way we... Uh, preserve the privacy is actually the topic of my next question and I would like to ask for technologies. Um, so there is privacy enhancing engineering and technological feasibility. There is, this is definitely feasible at this stage, but do you see a wider adoption when and how? We are almost at the end of the hour, so I would like to ask for quick answers from Dr. Koch and Dr. Petkovic, please. 
All right, uh, let me start. Uh, so PET, so we, we are engineers, we love acronyms. Instead yeah. of writing a privacy enhancing technologies, yeah. we just in short says PETs. PETs are important topic because right now, uh, if you think about it, the personalized medication, what we think about it is the, it's all about the data, the personal data. So the, uh, but the different countries have different regulations. So if I ask you how to anonymize data in X country with, with respect to Y country, Anonymization is, it doesn't have any standard either. So how are you going to anonymize the data? Before talking about the PETs, we need to talk about the how to anonymize the data as well. So for example, data mining technologies, machine learning, they are built to optimize the system. They are not, sole purpose is the privacy. So if you, then the, when you put the PETs inside, PETs create distortion. Uh, if in AI, we all know that garbage in, garbage out. So if you put distortion with using PETs, then the algorithms are going to suffer. And if you ch want to change the algorithm, it's going to cost lots of millions of dollars. So what you're going to do is, uh, the principle is there, is very straightforward. Privacy by design and uh, digital by design. So at the beginning, you need to start talking about these concerns. Other than adding PETs, of, uh, for example, if you have a well-known algorithm, if you add the PETs, it's going to create distortion. Uh, and then the, the distorted data is useless. So that's the reason that what I'm trying to say is in order to make it quick, PETs are going to be valid. But instead of PETs, if you start at the earlier and then train the old engineers, it's, we have the same problem with the coding as well. We have lots of coding and platforms, but the software engineers doesn't know how to create secure software. So then we are going to come up with some technologies to make the platform secure. So in the same thing is happening in the AI as well. Instead of we be designing the system to fully optimize, if you think about the privacy concerns at the beginning, the algorithms are going to be much better and faster and much more private. Thank you. Thank you. And um, yeah, Dr. So I, I believe it's uh, definitely uh, privacy enhancing technologies are very interesting and they range uh, from you know very simple technologies like you send the algorithm to data and then your algorithm is basically learning there so you, you can you know, uh, create a model in a hospital, you get the model back and you hope that actually the model is uh, de-identified actually, that there is no data coming back, but according to, for example, GDPR, you would need to show, to do a privacy impact assessment to really prove that. Uh, to, to technologies like homomorphic encryption and very complex technologies that uh, uh, um, basically require a lot of power, computational power, and sometimes uh, it's not feasible actually to, uh, to apply those. So uh, I think uh, what, what was also said is that basically the problem relies also very much in regulation and in, uh, in Europe, in the world, we, we are really not uh, aligning on this regulation. So we have uh, countries with uh, very strict regulation. Uh, health data is sensitive data for if you look at the uh, European uh, uh, Union, you will have actually this data is uh, regulated in each country. So GDPR provides regulation about personal data, but healthcare is sensitive data, so each country will regulate it separately. If you want, and, and, and you will actually build a, a great, uh, I, I think in Serbia we will build a great uh, uh, center and a great ecosystem, and you want to have startups, companies that, that would like to you know, ship the technology all around the world, you already have some here. So you have to face all these problems. You have to face a problem that if you want to put you know, your AI system in China, you need to actually get a cohort of Chinese people, data from China, train your AI models, and then ship your technology to China. So, and it's becoming very, very complex, so um, it um, requires some, some sort of alignment, uh, and I hope that will come soon. There is a data act uh, which is, which is uh, coming now in European Commission, which will also regulate the issues related to cloud, so that uh, uh, enables you to basically uh, not be locked in, in one cloud solution. So if you have Oracle, for example, in Kragwe, but so how you actually, uh, if they become very expensive, how you move actually to Amazon or to someone else. So that will, that will help, uh, I think. And, um, and there are other, other things related to sharing of data that, that are regulated with Data Act that would uh, help basically, uh, and maybe in some cases uh, not require privacy enhancing technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Petkovic. Um, so uh, we understand it's complicated but doable.
Is that the yeah, conclusion? I think so. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, wonderful. And my last question is really for Dr. Rakic because um, I think it kind of ties everything together and this is why uh, we are organizing this year the uh, Biotech Future Forum. Uh, really um, to address um, what was the idea behind the establishment of this AI institute in healthcare and how does it contribute to biotech projects and uh, eventually how does it contribute to society in Serbia and, and the world. Thank you. Um, so our institute is uh, general research and development of artificial intelligence. We have step, and these, this institute is formed as one of the measures for, as Mihalo mentioned, um, for development of uh, AI in Serbia. Um, institute has several of groups. One of the group is AI in healthcare and life science, and that's set up as a group. As basically, it's also a strategic interest of this government to to invest in that, in application of AI. Uh, I think um, that, I mean, I guess everybody here um, understand the importance of improving the healthcare. Uh, and uh, AI is just another technology to improve the healthcare system as any previous technologies that came, like sequencing came before, or even, let's say, radiology that came before. So it, I would look at it just as a new technology that we should now apply in um, healthcare system, uh, not in diagnosis, not only develop new ones, but already uh, try to improve the algorithms that already exist and, uh, and apply it to our healthcare system. So um, it is, in the sense, uh, revolutionizing the healthcare and research. But then probably, uh, to a certain extent, previous technologies did the same thing. So hopefully it will just smoothly transition and we won't just give a big promise without delivering it. <laughs> Thank you. So I think we are all part of that promise. And I would like to thank you for attending. I would like to thank uh, my esteemed panelists for joining the panel and sharing their opinions today. And um, I'd like to conclude that it is very clear um, that there is huge value in bringing all of the data uh, into healthcare and uh, biotech research, as well as leveraging artificial intelligence to create the blueprint for academic uh, research, for industrial uh, developments um, and in, in companies to accelerate this uh, progress in a patient first manner. And I would like to wish um, all the participants who engage in this uh, great success um, in these types of endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to our panel on innovation, uh, the business perspective, although of course innovation is relevant for all of us in all aspects of our lives, whether we like it or not. I happen to love it. I'm Rob Walcott. I'm a professor of innovation at the University of Chicago and Northwestern University, both in the great city of Chicago. Uh, I met uh, Marta Tomowska, who's over there in Chicago at, a, at an exec ed program, and she said, you must come to Serbia. And I said, OK. And then COVID hit. And so we had a bit of an interregnum, like many of us, all of us did. And so when Marta popped up again and said, um, Prime Minister Bernabic is having a program here in Belgrade, would you come? Of course I said yes. I remember having the opportunity to interview Anna Bernabic uh, in a video interview and in an article for Forbes uh, during the pandemic. And I was struck by how much was going on here how much was happening, how much had already happened. And I enjoy, as I said last evening in a dinner with the Prime Minister and some of us here, how much I enjoy being in places that seem to be at a pivot. I go a lot of places in the world, and I'll tell you there are places in the world that, well, aren't at a pivot. Serbia is one that is. So it's exciting to be here early uh, in that process. Uh, so what are we here to talk about with my, ha my new friends and esteemed panelists? 
We're here to talk about innovation and complex organizations. Now, Mr. Baloul from the Dubai Future Forum earlier today made the analogy to Dubai, uh, we are attempting to create a platform to enable everyone to thrive. And I like to think about it like that. But I'll use a, an, an interesting analogy, perhaps an awkward analogy, and that is of fermentation. So if we're here in biotech and healthcare, maybe some of you understand the notion of the fermentation technology that makes things like penicillin and beer and sake and other wonderful things like that. Uh, so the government provides the infrastructure, the great big things you put, the substrate and the feedstock. And the feedstock is the capital. But then they put these other things in, which are called microorganisms or bacteria. We are each bacterium. We are the ones that have to go into that vat and transfer the substrate, the capital, into new stuff. And so to talk about translating into new stuff, I have uh, some uh, four panelists with me here. And you'll note there's a fifth on the program agenda, Dr. Uli Betts, who will join us a little bit later to comment on all of the wonderful things uh, our fellow panelists have said and, and carry it from the perspective of a large established enterprise. So with that, what I've asked each of the panelists to do, I'm not going to read bios uh, because their bios are so extensive and impressive, it would take us the whole hour. So instead, what I've asked them to do is each briefly describe their organization and then share one significant innovation priority they have personally on behalf of their organization. So I'll start with Dr. Obradovic, Milan. Thank you very much, Rob. But first of all, I have to tell that it's my great pleasure being today here. Uh, it's not only because I've been representing Roche today, but actually because I come from Belgrade. I come from Serbia. I was born, raised, educated uh, here. And uh, today, I live and work in uh, Basel, in Switzerland. I work uh, with Roche and for Roche. And Roche is a global pharmaceutical and diagnostic company. And as such, I'm sorry to disappoint you. We don't have like one uh, innovation priority. <laughs> we have actually three of them. OK. Yeah, and the first one is about um, early and accurate diagnosis across the patient journey. The second one is about providing the medicines that provide superior outcomes for patients. And the third is about actually evidence-based insights that actually enable the medicines to evolve and ultimately to provide uh, then better, healthier, longer lives for uh, patients. But as such, uh, Rob, actually our backbone is personalized healthcare that we just heard here. And our right. definition for that is providing more, and, or actually for every patient, to provide right treatment at the right time, which treatment that provides better response, better outcomes for the right value, for the right value, right. because we want it in a sustainable way. So Milan, thank you for that. But I, I'm going to come back to you, because sure. uh, those are all really important. I would. I would refer to those as innovation objectives, the things we're trying to achieve. What I'd like to come back to you for after your fellow panelists is what's one challenge you face in achieving that? I know there are 69 or 70 different challenges, but what's one challenge that you and Roche face in achieving that big objective? Uh, Bill, tell us a little bit about your organization and what your number one innovation priority or challenge is. Sure, my name is Bill Moss. Um, once again, uh, I too am very pleased to be here in the forum today, having uh, worked with a team of uh, over 200 uh, bioinformaticians and engineers here in Belgrade for the last four years. Wow. Um, so I've become very um, uh, accustomed and uh, appreciative of the, uh, of the community here. <clears throat> At Seven Bridges, um, we provide bi bioinformatic e ecosystems um, to everything from large commercial biopharma, biotechs, um, government programs um, throughout the NIH and the U.S. and throughout various other um, governments around the, around the, the, around the globe, um, and then also work with um, publicly supported um, research organizations um, and really enabling the, the type of bioinformatic, genomic, multiomic type of analytics that Dr. Church was just speaking about um, in, in the previous presentation. Um, from our perspective, um, there's, I'm going to kind of hit you with two, because um, nobody can do one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so 
within seven bridges, you know, I'd say the, the, uh, there's many focuses, but right now we're in the second version of release of a capability that we call ARIA. And what ARIA enables us to do is to unpack the genome out of the variant file and actually expose every individual variant as an independent data element. And to have that sitting har harmonized right next to the demographic, phenotypic, EMR data. And to do that on the scale of millions of patients in a single, in a single, in, in a single environment, sitting on top of, of a massive annotation database that we developed with the US government in order to enable Mm. very intense population level um, uh, analytics and the ability then by leveraging that along with the analytic ecosystem to be able to take those population analytics and to iterate taking those results down into a targeted area and to be able to stratify very, very precise cohorts in order to be able to be very directed toward your objectives um, for, 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 for your particular research. Now in doing things like that, our biopharma companies then, customers, came to us and said, well, this is fantastic, but all the data that we're seeing out there that we have access to, whether through public forums or gathered in different areas or gathered from themselves, is generally very general, right? You know, it's just, we say precision medicine, um, but oftentimes the, the actual, when you get down deep into the science, it's not precise and, you're, and you have to find your way. So they came to us and said, can you figure out a way to go find us a cohort of 2,000 patients who've had this type of cancer, they're in this stage, they have these demographics, they've received these therapies, and they've been designated either responsive or non-responsive? And for years, the answer was no. But today, from Seven Bridges, we've actually spun out a new organization called, called the Unified Patient Network. And with the Unified Patient Network starting in the, in the US and able to be extended internationally, what we've done is we've created our own ecosystem in which we're enabling commercial biopharma companies to interact with the source of, of the data and the patient. So they're interacting with the health systems and the patients to be able to access those populations in order to drive very specific cohorts. Now, where we stand today is we've got um, Washington University, BJC, Providence, St. Joseph's, UPMC, and the Academic uh, Medical Center at Pitt working with us, which gives us access to over 20 million patients in the addressable population. And what we're able to do is because of the value that we can generate back to biopharma by going and sourcing these cohorts, we're able to push massive amounts of value back to the health systems and back to the patients. Yeah. So the patients are being sequenced at no charge they're receiving genetic screening at no charge. The patients are receiving genetic counseling at no charge. And their physicians are receiving peer-to-peer -peer counseling on how to, how to actually implement that, that precision health content into their care plan with findings. Now, the health systems are also getting a monetary return on value. But what they're doing with that is they're putting those, those dollars into grant funds in order to extend precision health services now to underserved populations. Great, great. Well, Bill, one of the things that was exciting to me about your model at Seven Bridges is trying to figure out how to align incentives and to bring the individual patients in in a way that's acceptable to them that thus allows us to unlock the granularity of the data to actually make better decisions and, and accelerate uh, trials and things like that. So you've, you've really gone all the way to the incentives for the health systems, for the physicians, for the patients and their families. And that's, it's really exciting to see how that mechanism might translate into other spaces. So um, let's go to Dan. Dan, tell us a bit about Huma and one innovation priority you have. Good afternoon to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Huma, as a company, we started with partnering with health system, governments, and pharmaceutical companies to bring digital first care and research at the scale. And perhaps I can give two examples of the work we did, especially during COVID, partnering with the government of Germany to look after all the patients that they had COVID uh, remotely at home instead of them needing to go to the hospitals by prescription of an applications and some devices that almost brings a mini hospitals to your pocket, to your home. 
And that's kind of the impact of a simple technology that can suddenly double the capacity of the government or a health system, or simply reduces uh, basically mortality rate by three, four times. These are the data that have been published. And we ended up doing that not only in advanced countries like Germany and UK, but also in Saudi and India, in fact. Uh, and that's the kind of the bulk of work we do in the healthcare side. We call it digital first care. On the research side, we do partner with pharmaceutical companies when they want to run clinical trial. The challenge with clinical trial is access to patients, diversity, speed of the recruitments, and ensuring patients follow the protocols as they're supposed to. And as a part of that, again, a technology like this in your pocket telling you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, it's a very, very key component. And I'm actually really proud that we had the opportunity of powering AstraZeneca vaccine clinical trial, world largest decentralized clinical trial has ever been done uh, as a company. And that is, again, another example of what we do with technologies that everybody, pretty much in every country, has access to. And most people can use it today. And by doing that, we have tried to make it simpler, a lot cheaper, and a lot more accessible, the access to care and research for everybody in the world, not only advanced countries, uh, everybody in the world, which is a passion of us as a company. Now, in terms of your question on my first innovation priority, you know, I've been thinking about it. And of course, I can talk about AI and predictive models and how exciting it is. But I think the most important innovation priority for me is how I can help my team members, mm. my team, to be healthy and active. This is something that we learned as a part of COVID, how important it is doing sport and eating healthy and having healthy habits like not smoking, not drinking too much, and so on and so forth because that changes your life, that changes your resilience, that changes the kind of energy you can bring to the work. And by doing that, you're expanding that energy to the technology you build, to the patients you impact. We have touched 27 million patients so far since the beginning of HUMA, which has been a journey of like almost 10 years. Uh, that is my number one priority, and it's something that everywhere I go, I really, really highlight that. Uh, promoting activity and healthy life uh, across all of us. Right. Because if you have that, lots of things that we talk about, drugs and this and this, they become less important as it is today. Well, absolutely, Dan. And, uh, and before we go into glory, I'm going to pick on you a second. First of all, I totally agree. And the notion of trying to enable your team to be healthy and engaged and inspired, not, not, they're, they're probably going to work harder actually, as a result of having that. But I, I would put in a little vote. I'm totally uh, all in for no smoking and all that, but I'd, I'd still like to drink a little bit. I hope that's OK. <laughs> it, it does impact your, your performance, uh, <laughs> especially if you work hard. Yes, exactly. Well, but so it is I'm, OK. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to think for a second while we go to Gloria for her comment, opening comments. The AstraZeneca trial was a milestone for your company, but in a way for the world. It, all, all of this happened so fast. I'd like to ask you to reflect on one thing that you and the team learned through that experience, something that was unexpected that you learned through that experience. And we'll come back to you in a minute. So Gloria, tell us a little bit about Temetica and your innovation priority. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation and having me. Uh, I'm Gloria, I'm a founder and CEO of Timedica, and our vision at Timedica is to craft the future of personal health. That sounds pretty big, and it's also a big vision we have. So what we're doing is uh, we're basically running the biggest real-world evidence platform in Europe. Um, we are collecting data around the patient from various different data sources, like EMR data, claims data, patient conversations, and we are aggregating these data in order to form more or less digital twins of patients. So what we can do with our data is basically not only tell you how a typical multiple sclerosis patient with a PPMS, for example, looks like, who is between 22 or 23, um, and female and living in a rural area in Germany, for example. But we can also give you a pretty concrete um, forecast 
if the patient is doing well or not doing well over the next six to 12 months when he or she is um, doing spe specific activities or behaving in a particular manner. So what we want to do is basically build the fundament for personalized medicine because we believe that personalized medicine needs an understanding of each person, otherwise individualization is not possible. And this is the reason why we are pulling all the information we can gather um, around the patient and basically form this, this twin picture. Um, we have come a pretty pretty long way, so we're more than, uh, I think we're seven years now uh, with, with Timidica on the road. And um, for I give you an example for, for Germany. Um, we are covering nearly one third of the entire population in Germany with our data sets. So one third of the population of Germany exactly, with your data yes. set. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the, the example I just gave you in multiple sclerosis is an example which makes me particularly proud because my grandfather suffered from a very severe form of multiple sclerosis. It actually affected my entire family, and I can even see it today how hard it was for the entire family. Wow. And when you imagine back then how cool it would have been giving this human being the opportunity to um, behave different and to actually act different, but also give his doctor the opportunity to adjust the treatment in the right way so that he has a better life um, over the course of the next month. And this is what's driving us at, at Timidica and basically giving us the opportunity to build the fundament for personalized medicine. So, so you have a personal purpose. You have, you have real personal purpose. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, Gloria. All right, Dan, what's something that unexpected you learned from the rapid mobilization during COVID? I think the experience as a whole has been obviously the biggest <laughs> achievement of my life personally because, you know, the vaccine was probably one of the few products that has touched over 2.5 billion people one way or the other. Um, cutting it by half because some people got two of it, so at least one billion people have been touched by the extension of the work we have done. So that by itself has been amazing, but that came with a big price because we had to do everything in less than three months. Yeah. And this is a very big undertaking, especially for a company that we had ultimately limited resources. We are not um, as big as like AstraZeneca or some of the bigger pharmaceutical companies. Um, and the biggest learning for me and my team was you can make impossibles possible if you put your energy and work. And we, we were working in two shifts on the technology side. So we had a team in kind of like a European time zone and another team in different time zone to be able to work almost 24-7. Wow. Uh, to be able to deliver by the time that we, we would go to bed, they would wake up and, and that kind of cycle. Uh, the other learning as a part of it was to make impossible possible, it does require a willingness of multiple stakeholders. No single company, organizations, persons can bring the change. And I'm a little bit uh, sad because during COVID, the collaborations was fantastic. You would get you know, support from regulators to technologists to delivery companies, uh, which we worked in some of our projects with Amazon as we shipped over a million devices to some of our patients' cohort and so on. Now, the same collaborations we could pull off in like two weeks, it takes six months. Yep. And that is, I think, a lost opportunity because yep. we can. And if we can, why we don't? We, we all felt it, we all saw it, and as leaders, one of our objectives should be to rekindle that experience so that people recognize what's possible. I, during an early stage of the pandemic, uh, was talking to the CEO of a Chicago-based company, a couple billion dollars a year, and she said, there is one change we made over the past couple of months, it's the sort of thing we all heard about, which is, which is within three weeks, we had this whole product online, right? You've all heard those stories. And she said, the interesting thing to me was, we had been talking about it for a few years, and the year before COVID, we hired some consultants who came in and evaluated it. We did a, a, a process to roll it out. We sat down and looked at this pilot process, and we said, oh, this will never work. And they canceled it. And then COVID hit, and within three weeks, they did it. Yeah. So how do we rekindle that? Everybody just had that experience. So 
the three of you, Bill, Dan, and Gloria, are founding building companies, building organizations. You work at Roche, one of the, one of the quintessential uh, health and pharma companies on the planet. You need each other. Small, rising organizations need the big established enterprises for different things. What are some insights about how we can make this dance better? How can we make the relationship between new or emerging companies and an established company like Roche much more effective? Uh, Milan, do you want to start with some thoughts about that? Absolutely. Just first to address like, uh, the, the question about the challenge that, sure. you, that, yes. that, that you posted uh, uh, yes. previously, the challenge for the innovation. Actually, innovation is never a challenge. The access to innovation is challenge. And <laughs> innovation, just because of the sake of innovation, doesn't mean anything. Like innovation and access to innovation actually have to go hand in hand. I'm very proud actually that I'm today uh, 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 with you here because of the also you, you could see also in the agenda that um, there is a partnership uh, uh, between uh, uh, Serbian government, Serbian healthcare system, and Roche. And actually, it's a huge shout out to, like to uh, the local uh, team also. And this is the key. These partnerships, like if we work in an urgency, now I'm addressing your mm -hmm. uh, recent uh, uh, question, that we can overcome all this if we are working like one ecosystem, but working with urgency and working with accountable partnership uh, on yeah. that. In this particular case, what the government, what the healthcare system here and Roche have recognized is that there is a need actually, to provide capacity, capabilities, know-how, in order how we can reach the promise of personalized healthcare and precision oncology, in order to address the burning problem, actually, of today's society. And this is, uh, this is actually that we need, that we are in need of personalized uh, solutions. Solutions that are actually therapeutics, diagnostics, that are going to provide superior outcomes like for uh, our patients. But for that, it's not easy. It's uh, not only because the trials are lengthy, because they are expensive, because of the regulatory, because of the policy, uh, but then at the end, all of this innovation, it's great, but without access, unfortunately, we're not gonna actually provide the benefit for patients. So it sounds to me like you're saying, first of all, understanding what we're all trying to accomplish, what's the mission objective, and then how do we ensure the things that we're doing that are working actually get to the people who need them? Uh, if both of those things aren't clear, then maybe we waste a lot of time and energy. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is, this is actually addressing the other, uh, the other question, where do we start? And uh, I ap absolutely appreciate all the innovation and all the startups like, and uh, all the innovation within, within a rush as well, uh, which is uh, uh, happening. But if we don't have a clarity about the problem that we are yes. uh, solving, this is a huge then problem because um, we uh, quite often uh, we actually get in love uh, with our solutions, yes. not with problems, uh, uh, actually. Right. And then we come like, uh, with actually a beast. Yes. A beast which is not applicable anymore in the real world well, setting. That's why this partnership is also important. Because, yes. for instance, partnership between startups, between big organizations, between healthcare systems, in case we are all in the same room, we're going to better understand the problem for the healthcare yes. system, for the patients, and then we'll be in position better to address it in a meaningful way. How many times have we been on a team where we realized later that we were working on the wrong problem? Uh, cognitive science shows us that human beings converge too quickly on solutions. When you're working on the normal day-to-day -day business, it's the right approach to say, got it, fix it, on to the next thing. But when you're facing something different, when you're looking for Terra, uh, Terra Novo, it's, uh, a dis it's the wrong adaptation. We have to go deeper on the problems and the challenges. Okay, Bill, Dan, Gloria, not everybody has to answer, but you I all are building companies. What, what can make this dance better? So I, I think the issues are much more, I agree with what you said, but I think there is a much more fundamental systemic issue underlying that has two components to it. You know, Seven Bridges is an enabler. We're about creating ecosystems. What we did with the Unified Patient Network is we figured out how to be able to create those kinds of synergies. But when you look at the research community, I think there's really two dichotomies, there's two issues. One of them is a dichotomy in that good doesn't create good. What, what do you mean? Funding creates good. It takes capital to create good. And so 
the motivation of, of the companies is ultimately to, to do good, make money, and do more good, which creates a, level, a, a, a foundation of competitiveness between the organizations. Now, it goes beyond that. It goes to a cultural issue that we see on a regular basis in our biopharma clients. The biopharma clients, they're not, from what we see, they're not even working together with that level of synergy between R&D groups inside of the biopharma organizations. Mm. There's, there, is a, there is a, in my opinion, a woeful lack of what I'll call hypothesis management and optimization. Someone forms a hypothesis and they hold on to it and they want to be able to drive that hypothesis and prove it and get it to where it is. And if there's another person with, a, with another group with, with a hypothesis that's similar and then bringing the two hypotheses together that might be able to get to a, a, a greater common good, we're not even seeing that happening at the foundational level. Wait, are you the saying there's ego in <laughs> research? <laughs> wow, you heard it here first. Yeah, yeah exactly. I <laughs> so, so all that having been said, yeah. and recognizing those issues, I think that, you know, I mean, I'm just reaching out there. If there was some way to get maybe better clarity around how um, pre-competitive collaborations can come together Great. and can be regulated and can be driven, I think we can start to address the, 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 the business competitive issue. That underlying cultural issue, we, we spend every day thinking about how to get you know, to the point at which, we're getting to the point where each within an organization we're seeing data sharing but we want to get to hypothesis sharing and, 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 and you know, creating that greater mindset around it. So maybe different rules of engagement that might allow us to intensify and accelerate that. Milan, really fast, and then if Gloria ecosystem or Dan... Ecosystem instead of ecosystem. The <laughs> right. what? Ecosystem. Ecosystem, ah, yeah. Ah, I love it. Ecosystem, yeah. ecosystem. <laughs> Good. Lego my ego. Uh, only people who used to live in the U.S. would know, and are old, would know that. Gloria or Dan, any thoughts about making this dance better? To build maybe on what Bill mentioned, I would, I would like to highlight two things. One is, you know, we talk about fourth industrial revolution, meaning that the topic that are important in that agenda has to be very key and important in the agenda of every leaders, every executives, every person that has managerial role in the context of pharma, healthcare, and government. Ninety percent of the people in roles, they have no clue about important topic, about digital innovation in the modern terms, AI, all the topics that they talk about it, but they don't know. Uh, what Dan, it is. are you talking about people in what's, <coughs> what role in government? Or Government, executive of pharmaceutical companies, okay. med medical technology companies, health systems. And that is a problem, you know, because how can you bring, adopt innovations if as a leader you don't understand it fully? You're going to be scared. You're going to rely on other people, and your team going to rely on other people. And then you go suddenly seven layers down. This is where a lot of disruption in terms of decision making happen. And if you're lucky, you might make some decision, and it might end up being correct, but it's going to take a long time. I think the lack of knowledge in the toughest level, it is a very big problem. And the knowledge is advancing so much that even for me, which I'm considered still, you know, uh, not too old. I am too old. <laughs> so. uh, still, I'm behind. I feel it, and I have to sometimes run. The second part is organizations partially because of ego, partially because of other reasons, are too big. You know, you want to make a decision within pharma. We talk about pharma because it's biotech forum now. You have to talk to 50, 60, 70 people. How can you get 50, 60, 70 people to agree on something quickly? So you're talking about one year, two years decision-making time frame. And one of the things that I'm really proud of as a counter with AstraZeneca, you know, when I told about you told you guys about him, I said, like, we partner with government, health systems, and pharmaceuticals. Partnership, it means a direct relationship, harmony, 
mutual respect. With AstraZeneca, three people, as a part of our partnership, make pretty much all the decision. The president, the chief digital officer, and the person that's in charge with us on our, on our agenda with them. We go to a meeting, we agree the top level. Of course, we in, get input from yeah. other people. That's necessary because you have experts from regulatory to legal to the local market and so on. And when we implemented that, that became now the flagship partnership for the whole, actually, pharma industry. Everybody talks about it. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, we were like spinning for like, and I have an example of one of our partnership. We have, we counted it, 550 meetings <laughs> with one of the biggest payers in the world. 550 meetings. And we ended up not working with them anyway <laughs> after 550. This is, this is a role for leadership to figure out what decision rights and what processes are going to work in which situation. Too often in large organizations, governments, nonprofits, oh my god, universities, everybody wants to bring everybody around the table yeah. and get alignment. Okay, now if you're trying to find a location for your Christmas party, great. Get everybody around the table, get alignment, make sure everybody's excited about it. Sometimes there are other critical decisions where doing that is dysfunctional. Um, and it's important to know the difference, uh, to have the processes and structures to do that. So, uh, Dan, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Gloria, anything you want to add about making this dance better? <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think every panel is discussing about how, how bad it is and how difficult Let's it is make to it collaborate. Good. Let's make, Let's it, make good. it good. Let's get, make it good. <laughs> We're working with, I think, more than top 10, top 15 pharma companies. And um, it's super simple because people need to understand why they want to do something. And that was basically the, 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 the time when we did not run against closed door was the time when we started to understand what is the incentive and what is the strategy of our counterpart. And the counterpart can be a pharma company, the counterpart can be a HCP, a ca the counterpart can be the health system, the payer, or whoever. We need to have a pretty deep understanding and basically need, we, we need to build a bridge. So when you have one side here, the other side here, one of the two sides need to build a bridge. And then it's just a question of capabilities. So who of these two sides is able to build the bridge? Sometimes it's both, sometimes it's one. And I always say the smarter party of these two are, are building the bridge, because without a bridge, there is no collaboration. And I totally agree with you, Dan. A collaboration is something which needs to happen on eye level. Um, I don't care about the, the details in the contract. When we have a common goal, we reach the common goal. And um, we are continuously interacting and, and, and driving this forward. So um, the biggest learning uh, I did uh, during my entrepreneurial uh, path and uh, entrepreneurial journey is Understand your counterpart and understand what the incentive is yes. the counterpart has and try to make this incentive possible. And that's super easy. And then you have open doors. Super easy. So we've heard that innovation is never a challenge. This stuff is super easy. Wow, I'm feeling really good about this. <laughs> I, I have to say, here's a, here's a thought for large established enterprises, but also for governments, maybe for Serbia. Uh, years ago, I did a large study about strategy in emerging technology markets, and one of the markets was pharma and biotech. And one of the things that was a huge factor was what do the researchers and biotech leaders think about how easy or hard it is to do business with a particular big pharma company? And they would all say, oh, you know what? When we've got something new, these are the companies we go to first. These are the companies we go to if we have to because these companies didn't say yes. And interestingly, uh, the, the 10 years following that, I sort of tracked it. The companies that everybody was avoiding started to have problems. Big Pharma, Big Pharma started to have problems because no one really wanted to work with them. Bill? So, but I think there's a distinction between what is it like to do business with a large pharma? We're in you know, more than 20 of the top 30 and doing business doesn't reflect with them, does not reflect my comments. My comments were much more, much more global in terms of sure. at an industry level yeah. in order to be able to accelerate everything. And I, I agree you know, with, with these points, um, but having the biopharmas work together well and folks sharing data, sharing thoughts on a 
on a horizontal plane, not not a vertical plane. Yeah, I think is would be bring incredible value to not only the industry but to humanity. So uh, I couldn't agree more. Where believe it or not, we're coming down to the end of our time, and the reason is. Uh, we have an opportunity after this panel to have a conversation uh, with Dr. Betts from Merck, German Merck. Uh, and so I want to throw one more question out to the panel for each of you. You're, you're all experts in your fields. You've been at this stuff for a while. You've accomplished quite a bit. What's one thing that has surprised you in your journey re regarding innovating across sectors, innovating between different organizations, innovation in healthcare? getting things to market, one thing that has surprised you, and what can we learn from it? Who'd like to start? Yeah, start. Bill. So, um, so Seven Bridges is, is in you know, the bioinformatics sector, if you will. And what shocked me coming into that sector from the outside was, was that all the players really in that sector driving, driving value we're focused on providing an IT solution, how to be able to manage the data more effectively from an IT perspective, how to process more effectively from an IT perspective that just happened to be, just happened to be pointed toward organizations doing that kind of work. Sure. Um, that shocked me, and, and, that, and, and it also created an opportunity for Seven Bridges, because what, what we realized in the, in, with the, in, in the client relationships where we had the best relationship and they were the most lucrative and everything, the difference was we were enabling them to lift the science. Um, and there's various ways we were enabling them to lift the science. And as soon as we bifurcated the market with what I call the fungible services line, everything that's just IT oriented below the fungible services line, ah. and all the ways to lift the science above it, we actually created a, a new sector that quickly changed the perspective of how we were being evaluated versus everybody else. And it was shocking to me that that was like a revelation for the, for the space. Well, so, so the data and, and IT and all, that's critical and it's important. But what you were doing, it sounds like, was saying these are the mission objectives of the people we want to engage, and we're going to focus on helping them become better at those mission objectives. Right, and mostly by clarifying the science. Great, great. Uh, quickly, Milan, one thing that surprised you, what can we learn from it? What surprises me, like uh, actually, how much with the beyond molecule solutions, uh, like digital health, uh, like artificial intelligence, within the healthcare uh, pathway, within across the patient journey continuum, we are actually able to provide benefit for patients and for the healthcare systems with simple solutions, actually, to remove roadblocks of the capacity in the healthcare system and provide them the value and impact for, for patients. Like, and it's just the, it's the tip of the iceberg that we heard about earlier. Let's on. see like, what's the promise. Like we heard today like lots, yeah. of, lots of promise and great, great vision, yeah. but now it's on us like, to deliver. To make it happen, yeah. Dan? I have lots of those, but I'm going <laughs> to focus uh, on the positive one, perhaps, <laughs> rather than the negative one. Um, you know, we all hear less is more. And that goes to one of my comments that you can achieve a lot with a small team. And there is a place here to celebrate and talk about the work that the team at Moderna, right? There are 4,000 people. They're running 100 proper clinical studies uh, for new treatments in parallel as we speak. Amazing. Companies of 80,000 people in the pharma, they do like 200. There are companies with 80,000 people, they do 200. Hmm. And that shows what you can do when you use technology, when you're efficient, when you're clear in your decision making, and we, when, when, when you look at things as a platform approach rather than individual teams approach. Yeah. Because there are so many shared resources you can tap into. Uh, that is an example that I right. think has really surprised me. The shared resources, shared hypotheses too. Gloria, last word. Uh, one thing that surprised me at uh, Timidica was um, well, we're in Germany, and the Germans are very, very famous for not sharing their data at all. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. Uh, we're <laughs> actively asking the patients if they want to share the data. And uh, we have a consent of between 70 to 80% amongst the patients on our platform that they have the willingness to share the data, which really surprised me because it's Germany, so I thought, uh, in all of the other countries, this must be 98% uh, plus. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was a positive surprise and some hope for Germany. 
That's great. <laughs> well, it's always good to hear there's hope for Germany. So <laughs> Germans are the best. <laughs> Milan, Milan uh, suggested we need ecosystems, not ego systems. We need clarity. We need urgency. We need accountability. We heard that funding from Bill, funding creates good. And I define that maybe as economically sustainable models that drive people to rise to challenges. And that is the essence of the marketplace. But in a different way, the essence of research and academia even, if we can find the common ground. And government to create a context in a world that's better for each of us. Dan, baseline understanding at the top, which by the way, you've thrown a gauntlet down to all of us as we age, as we become more distinguished and have more and more authority. We have a responsibility to remain relevant and to remain informed and not hide behind our titles. The impossible can become possible. That's quite exciting. But in order to do that, we, we got to make it better. As you said, Gloria, we've got to build bridges. I would say, by the way, build bridges before you need them. Because the last thing you want to do is go to someone when you need something from them and they don't even know who you are. And I would congratulate each of you for being here today because you've been hopefully building bridges before you need them with people here in Serbia and perhaps all over the world. And I, I'll end with the underscoring your personal commitment, your, your family, family's challenge in the history with MS. Um, and I'll share a quick one uh, uh, from my experience, real-time monitoring, bringing health to the home. My grandfather spent three years in a nursing home, and it's nothing against it, it was a wonderful nursing home. But my grandfather was a cowboy from Iowa. And when I say cowboy, he barrel raced. He trained horses. Yeah. He was a cowboy. And you couldn't imagine the experience of, of him spending three years in a bed in a hospital. What if we could bring that home? My father, on the other hand, died unexpectedly of an aneurysm at the age of 63. And I imagine if we have real-time monitoring all the time, my children perhaps won't have to go through that experience. Yep. So thank you so much to all four of you. Now get off the stage, because we've got <laughs> Dr. Betts to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, doctor, you are with the quintessential big pharma, but not just pharma, well right? Tell us a little bit about German Merck. Yeah. So, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, congratulations to this wonderful initiative to boost uh, biotechnology and digitalization in the fourth industrial revolution. So, exactly, Robert, as you said, uh, MAG is a vibrant uh, science and technology company. Uh, we are actually the world's oldest pharmaceutical and chemical company with a history that goes back to 1668, so more than 350 years of curiosity and innovation. And uh, we are one of the few uh, fully integrated uh, pharmaceutical and chemical companies. So we're having a business in pharmaceuticals, but also we are enabling uh, researchers all over the world with uh, our tools for laboratories, for chemicals, uh, CRISPR gene editing. And uh, last but not least, we have a third business sector, that is electronics. So we claim that we are also one of the enablers of the digitalization revolution. For example, we are providing uh, uh, compounds to boost the performance of microchips, liquid crystals for flat screen TVs uh, and the like. So is it accurate to say that you're seeing synergies between what's being developed, say, in the materials or chemicals part of the business and the healthcare yeah. part of the business? Indeed, we see uh, uh, strong synergies uh, between these businesses and, uh, as you know, uh, what we call game changers. Very often, uh, what uh, turns out to be then really moving the needle originates at the edge of certain fields, at the interfaces between certain fields. And uh, we are well positioned to leverage such synergies and, and to come up with uh, breakthrough innovations at the overlaps of different areas. Great. Well, so, Doctor, like, like Milan, you're with a very large organization, and our other three panelists are with companies that are growing at various stages. What, what are some observations of what you just heard, things that stood yeah. out for you? Anything you want to disagree with? Please disagree uh, with something. I, 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 I disagree uh, uh, almost with, uh, with nothing. I would like to agree with some statement, oh, okay. if All that right. is allowed. I'm looking so, for controversy. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, was, I was impressed on uh, the, the statement that the uh, 
collaboration and the speed was uh, extraordinary during the COVID-19 pandemic, where the world kind of really started to work together, which is really impressive. And uh, I would agree that in the meantime, we have seen kind of a re-emergence of bureaucracy and uh, Chinese walls between organizations, which is really a pity, because if you are looking at it, the fact that the key solution to end the COVID-19 pandemic was not coming out of established science, but it came out of completely new science. Uh, I mean, it was there were, were already. It had been it, around it, for a while. It, but it, it has been around yes. for a while, but it hasn't, there has been no president right. in the clinic. And that the solution came from such a highly innovative area, I think, is outstanding. It shows the power of innovation and what researchers can do for the entire world. Working together and also creating an atmosphere of peaceful collaboration between countries, between organizations. So uh, uh, let me add two sentences of what we at MAC did there. So we uh, uh, are uh, contributing there, for example, with special uh, lipids for the formulation of that mRNA. So we had uh, a kind of a small contribution there. Right. And uh, in terms of peace at the uh, occasion of our 350th anniversary of the company, uh, we launched uh, a science declaration uh, that is called Make Science Not War. And uh, everybody all around the world is cordially invited to sign this. It's a call to invest more resources in the advancement of science and technology for the benefit of humanity. I'd so say there are a few leaders that didn't get that memo. That uh, might uh, be the case. Maybe yeah. if you all sign that declaration yeah. at uh, makesciencenotwar.org, it will send a sign from this event here today into the world. Wow. So uh, let's talk about that accelerating, uh, the reemergence of bureaucracy. Let's set that aside. Let's make it better. What's something that you and your mission of catalyzing innovation across Merck, something that you've done that has really worked? And why do you think it worked? Yeah. So uh, indeed, catalyzing innovation in large organizations is a, a key task. And uh, uh, in my team, we are experimenting with uh, new approaches there. And uh, to view it systematically, what is important is that you have a top-down process for key strategic initiatives to uh, implement them, to focus them on them. But you also need something bottom-up, where the people can bring in their creativity and what they believe in. Uh, Gloria has before said it's important that you believe in what you're doing. And uh, this gives a chance for each employee to uh, come up with ideas and move them forward. So we have such an idea competition in the company that is called Inospire for innovation and inspiration. Then uh, what is also very important is an uh, uh, open innovation mindset, working uh, with partners all over the world, corporate partners, academic partners. And uh, we and Ma at MAC have a very strong history of doing that, like one of our blockbusters uh, for example, came out of a collaboration with an academic institute in, uh, at the Weizmann Institute. Mm. It's a drug against uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, so uh, uh, this is key. And uh, we also, for working with external partners, not only hand-picking, cherry-picking partners, but we're doing crowdsourcing activities. So uh, we are offering grants, MAC research grants, where researchers all over the world can apply for them. And we're also running a series of competitions with the scientific community, for example, one on predicting the most efficient synthetic pathway of a given small molecule. Let, let's and talk one about particular one that yeah. we talked about yes, at, at dinner, probably, that you're yeah. aiming through that, uh, that's called the uh, MAC Innovation Cup. And there we are inviting young, bright, talented students from all over the world to come to the company for a one-week summer camp and we combine them with retirees. So we have the very young talents. With people who've retired from Merck. Re who retired from Merck. So we have the very young talents and the old experienced colleagues. And it's amazing how well this works. So they form teams of high diversity. Right. They brainstorm. They come up with new uh, uh, ideas that uh, uh, one individual would never have been able to conceptualize. And uh, uh, they pitch these ideas at the last day of the summer camp, and the best team wins a 20,000 euro innovation cup. We had a tremendous success with it. Young talent joining the company, good ideas coming out that are implemented. Yeah. 
uh, it's uh, also, I must say, it's my favorite project that uh, I'm running among the innovation people. And, it, and it's really a one-week job interview for those. You get to see them. They get to see you. You've hired some of these people too, right? Indeed, yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, the, the energy and passion that, that they would bring, but also you think about people who've retired, and I know many of them, they're really going through a life transition. Mm. And to be able to contribute like that, they also aren't constrained by the internal politics or bureaucracy. They, they've been freed to just kind of say what they think and feel. It's really extraordinary. So what, what is something in your career transitioning from building businesses, mm. doing research, all the things you've done, and then you were, you were given this, this charge this, to lead innovation and catalyze innovation across Merck. What's, what's one bit of advice you'd give for established enterprises to do it better? And what's one bit of advice you'd give to Serbia to become a leader in the global healthcare and biotech space? Yeah. Well, that's really a tough question. I wish we'd have a line on that before. Uh, it's right here in your <laughs> okay, prep document. Okay, okay, okay. So maybe I, I didn't <laughs> rob, properly read it. So I mean, I, I'm not. I don't know if I'm in a in a position to comment on on established organizations how to do innovation. There are great examples out there uh, of uh, uh, wonderful innovations coming out, particularly in the in in the artificial intelligence area. Yes. Think about what uh, Google DeepMind is doing, where they were able to predict uh, the three-dimensional structure, more or less, of each protein uh, on the planet. Maybe not the new ones that Church is designing, but uh, the, the established ones. So I think one, uh, one key advice uh, that's, that's more a personal thing is you need to establish a culture where innovators and entrepreneurial thinking people feel at home, feel safe, uh, also, ability to fail, um, and uh, there is a, a, a term that is called intrapreneur. Yeah, it's an entrepreneurial person, but acting within the constraints of a large company. And we have heard from the panel before that sometimes it can be very bureaucratic. So you need driven innovators that do whatever it takes, and then are maneuvering also the internal committees to make their innovation successful, but in the frame yes. of an established large company that can provide resources that are usually not available for a smaller one. So I, I couldn't agree more. That's actually uh, has been a focus of my career to find those people in corporations that seem to be really good at that. Right. It's great to be an it's an extraordinary to be an entrepreneur, but it's a very different skill set to navigate within a big enterprise. Mm. But when someone can do that with something new, they can make an outsized impact at scale because a company like, like Merck can take that new thing and get it out to market much easier than most new entrepreneurs. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Uli, um, I'm going to put you on the spot now. Okay, we're coming down to the end. Three words, and don't explain them, three words to describe how you feel about the future. Hyphens are acceptable. Okay, so if you ask through... Oh, well, that's more than three yeah. words. Yeah. <laughs> three, three words to describe how you feel about the future. Hyphens are acceptable. Do not explain the words. Let me give you three words. One is truth. Okay. The other one is courage. And the third one is love and liberty. Truth, love, courage, <laughs> liberty, and maybe we add spirituality. That's five, but let's leave it. Wow. You have always been an overachiever, Dr. <laughs> Bat. <laughs> so let's thwart the reemergence of bureaucracy. We need top down and bottom up. Let's make science, not war. Let's find more homes for people. Let's recognize not only the promise and the potential of the young people we want to bring in, but also all the gifts that those who, of us who've been in the game for a while can bring to the table. I would uh, uh, corroborate your uh, program with young people by pointing out in, in Dr. Church's presentation, George Church's presentation, if, if you're not familiar with George Church, he is a singular individual in the global history of biotech. He's a central figure, read any book, any publication. And what's one of the things that jumps out at you? All the pictures and names of other people who've made this stuff happen. 
how many times he praises and thanks the people who make stuff happen with him. Truth, courage, love and liberty, apple pie. <laughs> Thank you so much, Uli Stetz. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody.